Hi, and welcome to Hiss and Tell, a cat behavior and more podcast, hosted by me, Christina Wilson, animal behaviorist. Today I'm speaking with comparative and evolutionary psychologist Brittany Florkowitz. She is the co-author of Feline Faces, Unraveling the Social Function of Domestic Cat Facial Signals. We are going to talk about her study, how she did it, and its implications for you and your cat. So let's get started. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Hiss and Tell. I am your host, Christina Wilson, and with me today is comparative and evolutionary psychologist, Brittany Florkowitz. Welcome, Brittany. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being (laughs) here. Um, So Brittany has done a really amazing study about facial expressions in felines. Um, But first, before we get into the nitty gritty about that, Can you tell me a little bit about your education and your history working with animals? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a comparative and evolutionary psychologist, and most of my work is focused around drawing comparisons between the behavior of humans to other animals to learn more about what makes us unique and what makes us similar to other animals when it comes more specifically to communication. I have a bachelor's, master's, and PhD in anthropology, interestingly Mm -hmm. enough, because one of the types of animals I work with a lot are non-human primates. So right. I work a lot with chimpanzees, with gibbons, orangutans, gorillas. I work with uh, white faced saki monkeys now, which are fun. Mm-hmm. So most of my research is typically with primates. So I got my degrees in anthropology because biological anthropology includes the study of non-human primates and right. because we're primates it kind of feeds into that comparative aspect but of course I've kind of expanded since getting those degrees and I, now I do research with dogs and cats and horses too. Oh cool that's amazing. Yeah. So what inspired you to to focus on feline facial expressions to kind of move from primates to yeah. cats? Yes it's very interesting because I mean if you go into my office at work it's just loaded with primate stuff <laughs> right um, and also I have a bunch of primate tattoos so most yeah. <laughs> of my life is encompassed by primates so this cat study that we're talking about today it essentially came about because a student Lauren Scott one of the co-authors on the paper she's the first author uh, she was a undergraduate student she was pursuing a degree in anthropology mm-hmm. and she wanted to go to med school she was already working with one of my colleagues, Dr. Daniel Fessler. He's an evolutionary psychologist, uh, psychologist there. And she was doing lots of different projects and roles uh, with his lab. But she wanted to get experience working with animals. She mm-hmm. thought the idea was really fun. And she just wanted to branch out. Uh, I have a lot of students who work with me in my lab who don't necessarily want to go into like veterinary school or right. go to animal behavior. But they just really love animals. And they yeah. just want to learn more. And they can get important research skills by working with animals that can also apply to humans in some cases. So she reached out to me and wanted to get some experience. So at first she started working with me on chimp projects, but then we got to the point where she wanted to pursue her own projects Mm -hmm. and she wanted to do something with facial expressions. And because my work is so heavily focused on primates. I already Mm -hmm. had that base covered. We were already doing multiple studies with chimps, with monkeys. I had collaborators that I knew were going to be publishing, you know, things that were similar to what I was doing with other species. So I felt like at the time we had that base covered and we did a literature review together and we noticed that there are a couple of species that just weren't well represented uh, when it came to facial expressions. And that included cats and horses. Mm. Uh, Even though people know a lot about their facial expressions, broadly speaking, there wasn't a lot in the scientific literature about the form and function. So I asked her to pick and she picked cats. (laughs) So that's kind of how the project got started. She wanted to do something independent and she wanted to branch out. So we both use this as an experience to kind of step away from primates and really dive into that comparative aspect. So not just comparing between primate species, but compare it between mammals as well mm-hmm. to see how are cats similar to or different from primates, but also what are some of the ways that they're communicating that's pretty unique or pretty interesting that we don't have documented thus far. Right. So that's kind of how all that came about. <laughs> that's that's so cool. Why do you yes. think uh, affiliative facial signals in cats have been kind of understudied versus all of the studies that exist about non-affiliative signals? Yeah, 
I think it's because a lot of these studies tend to focus on those aggressive encounters that happen right. between cats during mm-hmm. territorial disputes. And when you have that flooding of the literature for a particular context, there was even some publications that we quote in our paper that say that facial expressions, the primary function for cats is for these agonistic encounters, these right. fights that happen you know, during the disputes. So I think when you have that perception of the function of facial expressions and you continue to go along with that, you seldom get studies that kind of branch away and try to see, well, is that really the case? Because there's also like a high risk, high reward trade-off, right? Right. Uh, Potentially doing a lot of research and we've spent, you know, hundreds of hours coding individual facial muscle movements and cat facial expressions. So investing all that time and energy to find that, oh, actually, yes, you know, like, it maybe it's not what we initially thought that a lot of these signals are, you know, antagonistic. Uh, I think that puts a lot of people off from doing these kinds of studies. But, you know, when we were doing our literature review, it makes sense that there's facial expressions that help navigate fights between right. cats uh, because those are very risky and facial expressions compared to like actually scratching and biting. They're relatively low risk, but yes. they're very effective. So it's easier to produce a facial expression of like back off. I don't want to fight versus like trying to physically, you know, get into an altercation with another cat. It's a lot less risky. But also we know that through the process of artificial selection, domestication Mm -hmm. that humans have applied on cats, we know that they're a little bit more flexible in their social organization. People have households that have, you know, two, three, four cats. I have a household with two cats that get along quite well. Mm -hmm. And they engage in affiliative behaviors with each other. So it makes sense that in addition to those non-affiliative facial expressions, there's also going to be friendly ones that yeah. help when they're grooming, help when they're playing with each other. Just like other mammals, cats play together, yeah. especially kittens. So why not? So we kind of figured that, you know, this is something that hasn't received a lot of attention and it's something that makes sense to us in terms of the social organization of cats because of selection. So we decided to go with it essentially and see what was what was happening, what was there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the facial expression that most people are familiar with in cats is affiliative is the slow blink, right? With cats either doing that to us or towards others. And I think as we get more into talking about what your study found, we'll we'll talk about some some other ones. But do you want to tell us just kind of briefly about the four main contexts in which we see the intraspecific social interactions in cats? I know your paper covered that, but uh, there were two that you actually dealt with in your study and then two that you did not deal with because of, you know, where the study took place and um, just how, how you were able to do it. Yes. Yeah, so we're talking about like the, the mating context mm-hmm. and also like the context associated with, um, with kittens and like developmental stuff. Right. Um, so, I mean, the, we had the opportunity to conduct this study at a very unique location, a cat cafe. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the cats that were housed at the cat cafe were adults and they were fixed or or spayed or neutered. Uh, So when it came to mating behavior, that was not really something that was happening a lot given the unique structure of the cat cafe. But while we were there, we were seeing you know, these affiliative and non-affiliative interactions taking place. We were seeing grooming, rubbing, playing together. We saw fights, unfortunately, that happened. Um, Another context that we weren't able to really observe was caregiving behaviors, which makes sense because uh, at the cat cafe, whenever a cat gives birth, the kittens and the mother are moved into another location before they get their vaccines just for safety protocols, just to make sure that they don't catch anything because, I mean, the cat cafe is open certain hours to the general public and people can go to the cat cafe, they pay a donation fee, they get a coffee and then they can go and interact with cats for adoption. So they wanted to keep the kittens safe. So because of that structure of the cat Mm -hmm. cafe of the spay and neuter, and also like relocating the kittens and the mother for the meantime until they became adults, we weren't able to really look at that too much, but it would be a cool follow-up study to see we have the affiliative and we have the non-affiliative facial expressions. Now, how do the caregiving facial expressions and the reproductive ones fall into the scope of things? Right. Um, but we just focused for the time being on those friendly and not friendly interactions happening between adult cats. Yes. So how many cats were involved in the study? 
So there were, I believe, 52 or 53 cats involved, um, which is one of the reasons why we decided to do this at a cat cafe compared mm-hmm. to, because when we were brainstorming this, one of the options we had was going into people's homes that have multiple sure. cats. And, but that's very time intensive. Most people have around two to three cats. So we would have to go to multiple households. You have to account for confounding variables, like right. differences in household structure. Uh, if there's the presence or absence of other animals like dogs or, or reptiles or ferrets or what have you. So we wanted to find somewhere that had a large population of adult cats that was accessible, like very easy to observe uh, from a distance, but also that, you know, gave us the opportunity to see diversity in facial expressions with all of them living in the same environment. So that's why we chose the Cat Cafe, 53 cats. Now, the only downside is that a lot of these cats are mixed breed. Most of them mm-hmm. are some kind of mix of domestic sure. short hair. Yeah. Um, so it would be a cool follow-up study to see, all right, well, these are domestic short hairs, but, like, what about long-haired cats? What about other breeds of cats? How does their facial structure and morphology influence their facial expressivity during these kinds right. of interactions? Um, but, yeah, that's why we ended up going with the Cat Cafe Lounge uh, yeah. because of the 53 cats that was there, which is awesome. That makes sense. If you, if you ever need to do a follow-up, we have 13 cats. So you- Oh, nice. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I have my own lab in our house. Um, we have a lot of cats. <laughs> Can you elaborate on the specific methods that you use, like the facial action coding system, and, and just yeah. kind of break it down for people how you did the study? Yes. So when it came to going into the Cat Cafe Lounge and collecting video footage, because what we like to do is we like to collect video footage of these interactions taking place, bring that video footage home and code mm-hmm. it because it takes a long time to code. Like yes, one hour of video footage can take four to five hours minimum to code. Uh, so it's better to record all that while it's happening, bring that back and then engage in coding protocols. So for this study, we use something called the opportunistic sampling method. So Lauren Mm -hmm. would go into the Cat Cafe Lounge and she would record interactions that were taking place between cats that were active. One of the, the problems with a lot of the animals that we study is that, you know, they tend to sleep and nap during the day. (laughs) So you might be following one cat, right? Because you're like, oh yeah, rates of behavior. Let's follow the same cat for five hours. And then Mm -hmm. we can say this is the rate of facial expressions they're producing, but then they might fall asleep for three hours, you know? So we were seeing that happening and we're like, okay, this is not useful for what we're trying to do. So we ended up using that protocol where, you know, Lauren would go around the cat cafe and during off hours, so humans Mm -hmm. weren't present. It was just her and the cats. uh, She would follow the cats, the most active bunch of cats and she would record whenever a social interaction took place Mm -hmm. so then using data from the social interactions that are happening she brought that back home and then we were able to look at their facial expressions using the facial action coding system protocols so facial action coding systems or facts were initially developed by paul ekman he's Mm -hmm. a psychologist a social psychologist who Uh, studies emotion and he developed the facts initially for humans to be able to see the relationship between emotion and facial expression and he wanted to see which facial muscle movements are activated during these bouts of happiness or sadness or what have you Um, even though we're taking a more neutral approach to the study of emotion because you know we're not using methods that can get into the mental lives of cats Right. right like We have to just use external behavior, things that we can actually observe and quantify. Mm -hmm. Um, We can still use facial action coding systems because the protocols are very rigorous. It's very systematic and standardized. So the way that FACTS works is that every single facial muscle movement is assigned a unique code Mm -hmm. or an action unit. So AU12, for example, AU12 is lip corner polar. And whenever you code an AU12, it means the corners of the lips are being drawn backwards closer to the ears right Uh, so every single facial muscle movement is assigned a code and it's the combination of these facial muscle movements that creates an expression Um, now this is great because the facts places equal emphasis on learning both subtle and overt facial muscle movements Mm -hmm. and also the manual walks you through and trains you to identify the differences and similarities between these movements and how to code them accurately and in order to use facts you need to be certified so uh, you can download the manual 
on the animal facts website and then request a test and then what's happening is we're assessing whether or not our answers are similar to those of experts in the field to make sure that mm -hmm. when we are using these methods that we're using them in a way that makes sense and is consistent right. with current coding practices and protocols. So uh, usually certification with human facts takes over 100 hours. With animal facts, there's not as many facial muscle movements, so it doesn't take as long, but it's still dozens of hours that you spend reading the manual, looking at examples, taking the test, and then you apply it to these different types of interactions, these different kinds of studies. Um, we use it for research purposes, but mm -hmm. also I know that it, facts can be used for other functions. So for example, uh, animation studios use facts mm. to be able to learn how to animate faces and make them look more realistic right. uh, in movies and television shows. So there's lots of people that use facts for a variety of purposes. But for us, because we were interested in documenting how many different morphologically distinct facial expressions can cats produce and are these friendly or not, the facts made the most sense. So sure. uh, Lauren and I became certified in cat facts. I already had a bunch of fact certifications in chimpanzees, orangutans, and so forth. Uh, before the study, but Lauren got certification in cat facts, so did mm -hmm. I. And we applied this system to the video footage. So we would go in and we would watch video footage over and over and over again and code every single facial muscle movement that was produced while they're communicating with each other. Right. And we documented the total number of discrete movements, but also the number of unique combinations that we observed in the cat cafe. All right. That was a really good explanation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and it, it, it does seem like the facts gives you a much better way to be sure that you're in agreement rather than just kind of like yeah. a standard ethogram that I think is, is often used. Yeah. And I, I feel like maybe a little bit on its way out yeah. um, in terms of more modern research. So can you tell us a little bit about your predictions and your findings in this amazing study? Yeah. So we based on our, our literature review, based on the studies that have been previously published, we anticipated that there was going to be differences in the form and function of cat facial expressions. And right. we anticipated that affiliative facial expressions were going to differ in terms of their physical form, not just with like the composition of them, like the mm -hmm. discrete facial muscle movements, but like the number of facial muscle movements that are being produced to communicate. So our first prediction was complexity. We looked at this in a previous study and we found that chimpanzee facial expressions are more complex than gibbon facial expressions. Mm. And one of the reasons for why that is is that chimpanzees, they live in troops of like hundreds of individuals sometimes. And there's lots of different relationships. There's lots of different social interaction types that can happen. So having a diversity of facial expressions in terms of the number of morphologically distinct uh, facial expressions based on movement, but also just having complex ones to mm -hmm. communicate different levels of meaning, that made a lot of sense to us. Right. Um, whereas gibbons, now this isn't saying that gibbons aren't complex, but they have a very different social structure, right? It's usually a pair of gibbons and their offspring that defend a territory mm -hmm. and they engage in a lot of synchronous behavior as part of establishing their bonds with one another, but also defending their territory. So having very complex facial expressions doesn't really help with that process because then there's so many different possibilities that you have to be able to predict and synchronize. Mm -hmm. So we figured that because of the social structure of cats and because of, you know, their bonding mechanisms and the fact that they can establish relationships with lots of different kinds of cats in a colony setting, in a household setting, that the facial expressions that were being produced during those friendly encounters uh, would potentially be more complex than those right. that are not so friendly. Um, and also, if you think about it, because fights are high risk, mm -hmm. uh, you would want to make sure that whatever signal you're going to use, it's very clear, it's very obvious, there's no room for misinterpretation there. So right. it makes sense not to see a lot of diversity in terms of the physical form of those expressions. So that was our first prediction. The second one was the composition. So not looking at like the number of muscle movements being produced during these right. signaling bouts, but looking more about like what types of facial muscle movements. Is it mm -hmm. the case that the lip corner polar is only seen during friendly and versus non-friendly? Is it the case that, you know, raising the upper lip to expose the teeth, you're only going to see that during non-friendly, vice versa? 
So we wanted to see if there's differences in the composition. So after conducting our study and looking at all the different facial expressions that were produced during these affiliative and non-affiliative interactions, we didn't really find support for our first prediction. We found mm -hmm. that for both friendly and non-friendly, the average number of facial muscle movements per facial expression is about three. It's about consistent also with other studies with other animals. So mm -hmm. it seems like there's not really a lot going on there when it comes to social function. This is just something in terms of the average that right. these animals are producing, perhaps due to morphological uh, constraints or anatomical constraints. But we did find differences in the composition, though. So there are certain facial muscle movements that very strongly correspond to either affiliative or non-affiliative interactions. Uh, so when you put all those together and you compare them to like a neutral resting face, um, right. with friendly interactions, what we often see is that the ears will go forward mm -hmm. and then the whiskers will go forward and usually the eyes are going to be closed. And if you think about it like this, I mean, it's almost as if the cat is reaching out to touch the other cat, yeah. right? They feel comfortable. They feel happy, they feel playful enough to be able to reach out towards that cat. Mm -hmm. But in contrast with non-affiliative, right, the ears go backwards. The yes. eyes are opened and the pupils constrict to protect the eye, right? And you see that the mouth opens and the lips are being lipped as a, a response to prepare potentially for bites, prepare for a fight. Uh, so we see that in contrast to like going forward, you're going backwards essentially, right. um, which you know, again, kind of makes sense in terms of the kinds of social interactions that cats are engaging in on a daily basis, um, but also makes sense that even though there's lots of different kinds of facial expressions, we found 276, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's still consistency and similarities in the kinds of facial muscle movements that appear in those combinations, in those facial expressions. So even though maybe, for example, you might have a, a friendly facial expression where the ears are going forward, the whiskers are going forward, and the eyes are closed. Maybe that's accompanied by purring. Maybe that's accompanied right. by, you know, other kinds of facial muscle movements like the, the corners of the cheeks raising or something like that. I mean, that's totally fine. And maybe there's different levels of meaning. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's one of the follow-up studies we plan to do is see whether or not there's differences in the subcategories of affiliative interactions and if that corresponds to, you know, different kinds of facial muscle movements there. But it makes sense that there's similarities across these expressions, right? right. That all friendly ones or most friendly ones are going to have these movements and most non-friendly ones are going to have this other set of movements associated right. with it. Yeah. Make it very yeah. clear and easy to communicate. That absolutely makes sense. They're, you know, cats don't have the best vision in the world, right? Like, I think everyone who has a cat knows that if you put a treat right down in front of it, it's going to have a really <laughs> hard time seeing that treat, and you kind of yeah. have to make, like, a noise. You have to kind of give them some other cues because yeah. they don't have – vision is not their primary sense. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm personally very interested in how this – not amazing vision plays a role in their identification of these facial expressions. Did you like explore that at all? Or do you have any thoughts on it? Yeah. So in terms of thoughts, I mean, one of the things that we didn't do, but we can do in the future with follow-up studies is look at the intensity right. of individual facial muscle movements. So in the original facts manual, uh, Paul Ekman outlines a coding system that's based on an ordinal scale, where mm -hmm. not only are you coding presence or absence of certain facial muscle movements, but you're coding their intensity on a scale from A to E. Right. Uh, so A is very subtle, E is very overt, it's very obvious, and it's the most extreme form of that movement you can possibly produce. So this isn't something that we explored for this particular study, mainly because when we try doing this with chimpanzees, when it comes to coding on an ordinal scale from 1 to 5 or A to E, a lot of people choose the middle. Yes. <laughs> and it's very, one of the problems is that it's subjective, but also because other movements are happening, that influences the intensity coding. So, for example, if you're watching a cat that's producing like a play face where the lip is relaxed on the bottom, the mouth is open, uh, the jaw's going down, the corners of the lips might look a little bit more intense during that movement because there's other mouth opening features that, right. are, that are being produced. But in the reality, that movement might be kind of subtle in comparison. So there's a lot of confounding variables there making it difficult to code. So with chimpanzees, it didn't really pan out. So we didn't really do it for this particular study, but that's definitely a follow-up option. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things to consider is 
Paul Ekman describes it in the Human Facts Manual, but there's not really a lot of information about how to do that kind of coding in the Cat Facts Manual or the Dog mm -hmm. Facts or the Horse Facts. Right. Uh, so that would be something that needs to be developed first and rigorously tested through inner observer liability, through coding certifications before that right. can be applied to the study. What about, and I know this is, I'm just adding problems. I'm, what about... <laughs> What about uh, tail movements? I know this is completely outside the scope of yes. what you look at, but tails are so important to mm -hmm. cat communication. I wonder if at some point you or someone else would want to look at facial expressions with tail expression as well and see what changes, if any, that makes to results that you get. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, a lot of the studies that I've published before with primates involve not just facial expressions, but manual gestures. So mm. communicative okay. movements of the arms, right. hands, legs, torso. And a lot of animals utilize multimodal communication. Um, even things like insects, for example, yeah. like they use a combination of olfactory and visual or tactile and so forth to, to communicate with one another. So you know, with cats, it makes sense that chances are the tail movements and the positional behaviors and also head movements, generally speaking, likely factor in to those expressions. Because oftentimes when you think of a cat that's about to be aggressive, you usually think of the fur on the back stands up, mm -hmm. the tail is going to be outwards, and they kind of like raise themselves a little bit. And they kind of like move into a, I like to call it the boomerang format, right, <laughs> where they're kind of like yeah. turning in on themselves a little bit. So those types of movements are, in fact, happening during the study. They're happening while these facial expressions are being produced. But there's a lot more publications on the positional behavior compared right. to the faces. So our starting point was just, like, first putting this information out there. Mm -hmm. And now we're currently engaging in a bunch of follow-up studies. Um, we have a couple of studies that are under review. We've gotten revised and resubmit requests. Those have been resubmitted. We're hoping those come out very soon. Yes. Yeah. Um, Yes, very exciting. <laughs> but like we we now are expanding past just looking at the facial expressions and those compositions and mm -hmm. we're seeing how they're actually using them in the social interaction. Oh, so, cool. you know, for example, do cats do f rapid facial mimicry like humans, mm. like primates, like sun bears, like a bunch of animals do um, when it comes to these interactions? Are they waiting for a response? Are they engaging in flexible and intentional communication? So we're waiting on, hopefully, fingers crossed again, these studies uh, will be approved, and then we can kind of talk more about how these facial expressions, they're only a small part of a bigger picture of interesting cognitive phenomena mm -hmm. that cats are engaging in on a daily basis, but also how this relates to other kinds of bodily movements and other forms of communication as well. That's super cool. I'm, I'm excited. I hope no more yeah. rounds of changes and you <laughs> publish. Yes. Yeah. <sighs> um, so in your study, you suggested that domestication likely yeah. influenced a, a lot of the development of these cats' intraspecific uh, facial signalings. Can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, when you compare domesticated cats to other cat species, like wild cats and big mm -hmm. cats, uh, we notice that domesticated cats tend to be a little bit more flexible in their social organization. You know, they can be happy by themselves in a household, in an apartment, and they also thrive on literal islands in mm -hmm. massive cat colonies interacting with each other on a daily basis. So, you know, compared to their wildcat counterparts, cats are pretty social, right? They, right? Oftentimes we have this perception of cats as being antisocial and just fighting each other all the time. But the reality is compared to other types of feline species out there, they're really social and they're very flexible in that social organization. So it seems like, you know, part of that flexibility in their social organization is somewhat in part due to human influence. Mm -hmm. We see that a lot of domesticated species, not just cats, but, you know, goats and sheep and whatnot, they become more social with each other and affiliated with each other and tolerant over time because we're selecting for those traits, right? right. We want cats that we want to have a bunch of cats in the house and we want them to get <laughs> along with one another. Yep. We want to be able to have species that can interact with one another. Uh, there's some really cool research. This is a sidebar, but there's really cool research on dog horse interactions and yeah. they produce facial expressions that they understand like horses respond 
to the facial expressions of dogs accordingly. And it seems like part of that is due to domestication. We mm. as humans, we want these animals to be social with us, with other animals. And as a result, that's changing their social landscape. Even when right. humans are out of the picture and you're looking at islands that have cats on it where there's no humans present. I mean, they're still engaging in these kinds of social interactions and that interesting social structure. So mm. it seems like having these facial expressions helps to navigate a wide variety of both friendly and not friendly social interactions. And that's largely in part facilitated potentially by the fact that humans were selecting for sociability. Now, in order to verify this claim, we would need to do some comparative stuff with big cats. So like, right. let's say doing tigers and lions and see how are they using these facial muscle movements during communication? And how is that similar to or different from domesticated cats? How about Scottish wildcats? Mm -hmm. um, what are they doing that is similar to or different from domesticated cats? Because that would let us know if we're seeing that, let's say hypothetically, in contrast to domesticated cats, they're producing you know, fewer facial muscle movements during these bouts of communication. All of the facial expressions are the result of fights and agonism. And there's different kinds of facial muscle movements that are associated with those that would kind of indicate that there's something interesting happening with this domesticated species, right. uh, domesticated cats that we're not really seeing elsewhere because of human influence. Uh, so we would need to do some follow up studies for that. But it seems very plausible, given that unique social structure that's been facilitated by humans. Do you think it could be also um, less that people have self-selected or people have selected cats because we've done it so much less than we have with dogs because our history mm -hmm. with cats is so yes. so new right it's only like ten thousand years of the domestication of the cat versus yeah hundred thousand with the dog where we really have bred and selected dogs to have this sociability like have all the characteristics that we want right to make them sort of human yeah. dogs well, cats are really still very much cats. They're, yeah. They don't <laughs> seem to be a whole lot different. And in fact, their DNA is not really unchanged. So, mm -hmm. and I think you touched on this in your, in your paper, in your literature yeah. review, that um, a lot of this could be potentially because they needed to learn to cooperate um, and be around each other to mm -hmm. get food from humans or to at least, you know, get, obtain grain or, you know whatever the yeah. whole story was when they were first beginning to live with people. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. That's an Absolutely. interesting, I mean, Brian Hare, he has a very interesting book on the history of dog domestication. And one of the things that he argues is that we often see domestication as something that humans are doing, right? right? Like humans are applying domestication to animals. We are artificially selecting for traits, but you know, one of the things that he argues about the history of dog domestication is that, you know, chances are dogs self-domesticated at first, dogs mm. that were friendly, dogs yeah. that were tolerant and went into these human encampments and they were able to kind of like at least coexist peacefully with humans. Those are the dogs that got more food. Those are the right. dogs that got opportunities to go into these, you know, small scale living settlements and then that's when humans realized their utility and thought, okay, yeah, this is something that we want to like actually actively select for. So Brian Hare argues for the self-domestication hypothesis. And chances are that's also applying to cats too, right? Where, you know, cats that, you know, if you go outside and you see a feral colony, chances are the cats you're going to want to interact with are the ones that are not going to actively try to maul you, right? Yes. Cats that, you know, are okay with you approaching <laughs> them. Uh, they're going to be way more successful at receiving yes. your affection and attention compared to other cats. So it seems likely that, you know, the origins of domestication, there's probably a little bit of self-domestication happening in there as well as, you know, humans taking a more active role in artificial selection too. Yeah, that all makes sense. Okay, so you had uh, 27 males and 26 females in the study. Yeah. And then you found, I'm just reading off my notes because I can't remember this, but you found oh, okay. 413 facial signals from the males and 275 by females. So that's like pretty pretty skewed. Do you have any mm -hmm. idea why the males seemed to produce so many more signals? Yeah. So with the male and female cats, I mean, all of them are out in the main lounge area. So right. to kind of give you some perspective, the, the cat cafe lounge, there's a indoor lounge area. That's like the biggest section. 
And then there's an outdoor catio section mm-hmm. that, that they like to call it, where visitors can go and sit on patio chairs and it's kind of enclosed. And then there's also a back room where mm-hmm. cats can go to use the restroom, but also if they're feeling a little bit like not social with humans yeah, like coming in to visit. Out. Yeah, they can go there freely. There's like little cat flaps all around oh, the nice. cat cafe to go into. So that's really nice for them. Like they can yeah. choose to interact with humans if they want to. Um, so during these types of interactions that are happening, so we followed cats and Lauren was going into not just like the main lounge, but the catios and the back areas, right? Cats can come and go as they please. They can frequently interact with one another as well. Um, so chances are there's a little bit of like assortment happening there where cats are engaging in particular kinds of social interactions depending on their pre-existing social bonds. Mm-hmm. So it's plausible that, you know, you maybe you have two or three male cats that already have a relationship with one another that she's following and they're producing lots of facial expressions, you know, as part of that right. bond management. And maybe the female cats, you know, aren't doing as much of that. We didn't look specifically at like why and what kinds of facial muscle movements are unique to the male versus the female cats. Cause right. we were interested in more like big picture species, you know, level phenomena, but mm-hmm. Um, It could be the case that there's some bonding that's happening. The Cat Cafe Lounge, a lot of the cats they receive are from the streets or have been surrendered uh, to shelters around Los Angeles. So a a couple of the cats that came in did have pre-existing bonds. We had a couple of brother uh, pairs, sibling Mm -hmm. pairs uh, that came in. One of them was a blackberry and black cherry, (laughs) two like uh, (laughs) long-haired black cats. They were so cute, very very interesting pair but we would see a lot of that where we were getting siblings and it was usually now that i think about it it was usually like male pairs of cats so chances are if they have certain kinds of relationships that they rely on on a daily basis and they're you know interacting with on a daily basis there's going to be some bias towards them versus like interacting with other females other males and vice versa sure all right um can you sum up your kind of findings and conclusion for our listeners so that they know yes in layman's <laughs> terms what you found yes so <laughs> very simply cats produce a lot of different facial expressions i was very surprised at the number of just morphologically distinct facial expressions because mm-hmm. we found you know 276 morphologically distinct you know facial expressions that spanned across, you know, all of these observations. And when you look at the amount of video footage we were using, we gathered like 194 minutes of video footage, but we gathered, you know, 156.5 hours for chimps and got, you know, 376. So the fact that, you know, we're seeing large numbers Mm -hmm. with such small video footage that are comparable to the numbers of chimpanzees. That's very impressive. So we were very excited to see that, you know, there's over 200 different facial expressions that cats are producing. So that was one of the cool findings. Um, And a lot of people were very excited about because they're like, oh, that's a lot more than we thought. We thought that cats just produced two, you know, very stereotypical facial muscle movement combinations. And then that's it. But there's actually a lot more. Um, So then when you break down those 276 morphologically distinct facial expressions using fax coding approaches, uh, what we end up seeing is that there's a breakdown of facial expressions that are used in both contexts, but Mm -hmm. also there are subsets of expressions that are used exclusively for affiliative and exclusively for non-affiliative interactions, which implies like a very strong social function tied to those. Um, So I believe we found that out of the 276, 48 are used in both contexts. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the cool things about this is that this could imply communicative flexibility, that facial expressions take on different meanings depending on other contextual factors, which is cool. But then out of the remaining, 228 morphologically distinct facial expressions, 126 are friendly only, and Mm. then 102 are non-affiliative, not friendly. So we see that there's very discrete form and function relationships, which is kind of cool. Um, Because again, one of the possible findings we could have had was that they just are used all the time for everything, which, yeah. you know, maybe is cool for communicative flexibility, but we're seeing that there are some patterns that we can hone in on that let us know as pet owners, like, oh, yes, a fight's about to take place, or like, oh, this is actually going to be friendly. Right. Um, 
So then in terms of the predictions, we've already talked about that a little bit, but there doesn't seem to be differences in the number of facial muscle movements produced during friendly versus non-friendly interactions, mm -hmm. but there are those differences in the composition of those facial expressions. Ears forward, eyes closed, whiskers forward. Usually you see that in friendly facial expressions, affiliative, but ears backwards, pupils constricted, mouth is open, lips are being licked, that's non-affiliative. So we see you know, these very discrete facial muscle movements corresponding to either these affiliative versus non-affiliative contexts, which for us has been great for branching out into follow-up studies where we can potentially conduct studies on how people perceive and predict the behavior of cats after mm -hmm. these kinds of movements are produced and also creating, you know, materials for, for example, kids. Uh, we've done some like kids TV shows in Canada mm -hmm. and in France where, you know, you can use that information to help people learn more about cat behavior and make predictions about how these cat cat interactions are, are going to go, which is really cool. That's awesome. Yeah. That yeah. was going to be my next question is, are you going to develop or do you think anyone's going to develop like an app about cat facial expressions or, you know, even just a PDF that's like, here's this expression, yeah. here's this expression, like, let's look for these things, you know, so that this means my cat might be stressed or my cat might be this or my cat is happy. Like, do you have anything in the pipeline in terms yes. of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We actually have a couple of studies. We have um, AI studies that are coming mm -hmm. out. So like seeing whether or not we can train models Ooh. to use information about facial expressions to make predictions for you about how things are gonna go. We have a collaboration with Companion Animals New Zealand in the works that is going to essentially allow us to look at how people perceive of these facial expressions and muscle movements and then use the results of that study to develop materials that can be posted online. One of the things that we're trying to do, and this is very ambitious, is create a cat dictionary of different facial expressions that are illustrated, have photo examples, have video examples, and then just have an entry for each mm. uh, based on which expressions people, you know, tend to struggle with the most, which movements people tend right. to struggle with the most. Because some of these movements are very obvious, like licking the lips, like very easy to yeah. spot. But sometimes those subtle, like, ear rotating backward movements, a little bit harder to clock. So yeah. it's good to have those materials available. Uh, so we're working on some studies related to that, which is really cool. And then we're also developing and looking at tools that allow us to look at other kinds of facial expression phenomena, such as rapid facial mimicry, which feed back into those applications and those models that can be used to predict behavior. Because ultimately, facial expressions by cats and other animals, those are being produced to allow recipients to make predictions and right. bets about what's going to happen. So it's really cool to be able to use that predictive framework to generate materials that help people learn more about their cats in, in various ways. And also thinking about the implications this has uh, for veterinary practices, right? Yeah. I, I know a lot of the stuff has been done on pain and pain facial expressions, but mm -hmm. You know, thinking about adoptions, right? Thinking about how we can use information on facial expressions to assess compatibility between cats, how we can use that information to assess, you know, housing arrangements in a vet's office whenever you're housing multiple cats together, you know, right. like, should we put these on the separate side? Should we put these together? You know, all of that kind of factors in to different kinds of tools and techniques that we can develop using this information, which is kind of cool. I, when I talked to Lauren about this, when the study gained a lot of popularity, we initially weren't planning on doing any more cat studies. Yeah. We were going to go back <laughs> to the realm of primates. But yeah. I mean, just the fact that people are really excited either because they're like, I was right, cats are expressive, or they're like, I have no idea that cats produce that many expressions and that right. they have differences in meaning based on the physical form. I mean, that interest has really inspired us to keep going with it. And mm -hmm. as a result, we have a bunch of collaborative partnerships with, you know, cat cafes and also research groups across the world now that are kind of like coming together and working on this to bring this information forward and, and see how, how can we potentially transform it to help everyday pet owners. Right. Just That's cool. cool. Um, so I think now we'll, we will segue into some listener questions. Um, the first one that I have is, what does it mean if my cat doesn't return my slow blinks? Do you have any thoughts <laughs> on that? Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, 
the, this study and our research mostly looks at cat cat interactions, yeah. <laughs> right? So I can't, unfortunately, I can't tell you much about your own personal yes. interactions with your cat. Um, I will say though <laughs> that um, there's a lot of interesting studies that are coming out. Uh, one of the ones that kind of relates back to this in a tangential way, but is um, baby talk with mm, cats yes so dogs love baby talk they eat that up um but cats it's interesting they only like baby talk when it's coming from their favorite person mm -hmm. um so it seems like developing a strong bond with your cat helps in terms of communicative styles and receptiveness to attempts to communicate is really key there um so just keep working at it you yeah. know like <laughs> keep interacting with your cat you know it'll eventually get there yeah it might be slow but It'll happen, you know. <laughs> I, I would also say that, like, I would like to know, just as, you know, a behaviorist, I would like to know the history of that particular cat, because especially if a cat was raised yeah. as a singleton, they may not understand kind of normal cat behaviors, and they just mm -hmm. may not have that in their repertoire, right? We have we have one of our 13 cats uh, we had to raise from two days old, and, you Aww. know, she was a singleton, just she couldn't, like the cats in the shelter, she couldn't interact with the rest of our guys until she had all of her shots and stuff because we yeah. had a, um, a silent... Uh, Khaleesi virus carrier, so it would have made her Ooh. really sick until she got her shots. Um, so she was essentially just alone in that really yeah. important socialization period. So oh, she's, I see. she's just a bit of a weirdo. She does not understand yeah. how to be a cat. Her communication style is like hissing and she just doesn't get it. She's just like, here's yeah. a sound I can make. She doesn't understand slow blink. So perhaps this person's cat also had a, yes. an upbringing where they didn't quite learn you know, normalized cat behaviors. Yeah, absolutely. There's a so. lot of social input when it comes to learning about facial expressions, positional behaviors, and so forth. So yeah. that's really important to consider as well. Yeah. Um, so the second question is kind of along the same lines is, do squinty yeah. eyes really mean affection? Hmm, do you, to do humans you, or I guess cats? I, either, what did you learn in your study? Yeah, so eye closing movements usually af associated with affiliative facial expressions mm -hmm. and affiliative interactions. So chances are, if they're producing it towards another cat, it's probably a good sign, right? right? Um, with humans, it kind of depends on the interaction type. So, for example, um, you know, allo grooming and allo rubbing, yeah. that might not necessarily involve like the eyes closing or the eye aperture becoming more narrow. Um, but you know, it's typically generally when it comes to cat-cat interactions, probably a good sign. Um, as long as it's, you know, not accompanied by any of the antagonistic movements or positional right. behaviors or vocalizations as well. Okay. So are cats communicating yes. with intention through their eyes like humans Ooh. when they stare? This is a good one. Yeah. Um, so we're doing a follow-up study that looks at flexibility and intentionality and goal association and cat mm -hmm. facial expressions. Um, one of the things that I study in primates, non-human primates, is gestural communication. Mm -hmm. uh, I mostly do that to better understand the origins of human language. But after doing this study, one of the questions that I've had is, well, you know, humans use a lot of gestures, and that shapes the cognition and communicative strategies of domesticated animals. So dogs, mm -hmm. for example, when we point at something, they look immediately. Yeah. They understand the gesture. They do the corresponding movement that goes along with that. Um, and they kind of understand that we're trying to direct their attention. They understand the the intentionality of that movement. Right. Chimps, you do that, they have no idea what you're doing. <laughs> so they just huh. don't. You know, unless chimps yeah. have been really habituated to human presence and trained to do that kind of thing, they don't pick up on that as easily or readily as, you know, young puppies do. Right. Um, which seems very quick. So I was very curious of whether or not cats, as part of their facial expressions, positional behaviors, and so forth, um, do they communicate with the same degree of intentionality mm. and communicative flexibility that we see with other animals in their manual gestures. So that's a follow-up study that we're doing um, and we're hoping to have published next year, which will hopefully get your question of like, does my cat communicate with intent? Yeah. Um, you know, which maybe, maybe not. 
Yeah. We'll stay tuned we'll to see. find out, I guess. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll have to have you back on to discuss the findings of your study. So another question is, is my cat holding his whiskers back while he eats or is he grimacing? So the whiskers going backwards uh, during an interaction. So with a cat-cat interaction, right? Uh, we found that that particular well, movement the whiskers backwards mm -hmm. kind of like you know it doesn't really seem to correspond strongly with the you know affiliative versus non-affiliative now with the pain grimace scale um potentially does but when it comes to friendly versus not friendly interactions with other cats we find that that particular movement not as informative as whiskers going forward that right. seems to be more informative of context all right why will my outdoor feral babies give me trust facial expressions but not let me pat them <laughs> Got to build that bond. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I would just say it's one thing to trust someone who's standing far away from you, but it's another thing to, to trust them to have a physical interaction with you, right? So I think it's mm -hmm. just going to be time and patience. With, that's mm -hmm. always the key to anything with cats is, is patience and taking it slow and, and yeah. letting them be in control and, and doing it on their terms. Um, Absolutely. So... I, I think it's great if they're giving you trusting expressions. I'm assuming they're talking about like slow blinks and, you know, yeah. the stuff that's kind of out there in the general literature. Um, and just don't, don't force it. I, I think it totally yeah. makes sense that they're like, okay, you feed me, you're over there. Don't touch me. Like let them come yeah. to you. Um, yeah. There's an, there's a cat behaviorist. I don't remember which one it is, but like their classic go-to is don't force an interaction. <laughs> oh, absolutely. You should never. Yeah, never it's, force an interaction. <laughs> never, ever, ever. It's, I, I really maintain that cats are amazing teachers of consent and everything, yes. everything that you do with a cat, it should be their choice or they should have the illusion of choice mm -hmm. because otherwise that interaction is not going to go well. What are the most common expressions and do they mimic human ones to some degree? Ooh, interesting question. So, I mean, obviously the, the affiliative and non-affiliative ones I described don't really apply right. to humans because we yeah. have very limited ear mobility, which is unfortunate because macaques, yeah. for example, have amazing ear mobility, but it's okay. Um, obviously no whiskers either. Now, there are some facial expression types that are homologous. Uh, mm -hmm. They're widespread across multiple species because they serve an adaptive function that is useful for all animals and the kinds of social negotiations that are happening on a daily basis. So um, an example of this is a play face, right? Mm -hmm. So play faces produced by humans, uh, our play face is human laughter, right? Where the mouth is kind of opened, the, the bottom lip is relaxed downwards, the corners of the lips are drawn backwards, but you know, it's produced during very friendly interactions when we're having a good time. Chimpanzees, you know, uh, other great ape species, monkey species, bears, mm -hmm. dogs, horses, like lots of animals produce this. Um, and it makes sense because play, just like aggressive interactions, you know, play is potentially risky. It can yes. get out of hand very fast. So having a facial expression that helps to modulate the play bout, right? So we've seen previous days with orangutans, right, have shown that there's different kinds of play faces that increase or decrease play intensity, change mm -hmm. the type of play that's being engaged in. So this helps to modulate a potentially risky behavior, but play is so beneficial to animals, right? It gives yes. them good sociocognitive skills. It gives them fine motor skills. So all of that is being acquired through bouts of play. So it's worth it to have play and to have communicative mechanisms that allow, you know, during that social interaction for an organism, an animal to be able to kind of, you know, control what's happening to, to some extent. Right. So we see that just like with all those other animals, this is another publication that's coming out, we see facial muscle movement combinations. Oh, and I also believe we mentioned this at the end of our paper in the discussion. We see play faces. Cats produce play yeah. faces as well. And, you know, it's one of those things that hasn't been widely documented or studied. Uh, so, for example, rapid facial mimicry hasn't been studied in domesticated cats, hasn't mm -hmm. been studied in big cats, but not domesticated. But it makes sense that they have those, and they're very similar across organisms because all animals play. Yeah. Um, so it looks very similar to what we would see in humans. Um, we just have to make sure that we're not assuming that all facial expression types are homologous. Um, the classic example I give when I'm teaching animal behavior, um, chimpanzees produce something called a silent bare teeth display mm -hmm. where, you know, the, the corners of the mouth you know, go backwards towards the ears, both right. rows of teeth are exposed. It kind of looks like a human smile. 
So when people see silent bear teeth displays, whether it be in the zoo or like on birthday cards, this comes up a lot for some reason. Um, people are like, oh yeah, that chimp's happy. That chimp is terrified. Oh no, yeah, it's fear, life. right? Yeah. It's so afraid. It happens during like interactions where there's aggression and there's right. a high risk of bodily injury and they're trying to be submissive to reduce tensions. So, you know, we have to be careful because just because a facial expression looks like something we produce, it doesn't mean right. it's necessarily the same thing or it has the same function. So we just have to be cautious of that. But play faces are a good candidate for this um, because we see that they're produced during affiliative interactions with cats and they have the same facial muscle movements as we see with human laughter faces, which is kind of cool. Can you explain what a cat play face is? Yeah, so play faces are produced when they're doing playful interactions with other cats with toys or each other. Right. And the way that it looks is the corners of the lips are drawn backwards. The bottom lip is relaxed and the jaws relaxed so that you don't, sometimes you do, but oftentimes you won't see the top row of teeth. It's usually the bottom row of teeth that mm -hmm. you see. And sometimes there's tongue protrusion that happens as well. Um, so it kind of looks like they're just doing like, you know, a little bit of a like, yeah, face. <laughs> I have really bad facial mobility, no, by the okay. way, which is funny as someone that studies facial expressions. So, you know, but it's like, yeah, just like the little like, yeah, you know, so that's what it kind of looks like. And you'll see this during play when they're interacting with one another during high intensity bouts. And, you know, it's very different from those aggressive facial expressions we were talking about where the ears are backwards and, you know, they're licking the lips in anticipation of, you know, doing biting behavior or something right. like that. Um, so they're pretty easy to identify during those playful bouts, which yes. is kind of cool. And I, I get a lot of questions from people um, saying, oh, how do I know if my cats are playing or fighting? So I think that's a good clue. And then Ooh, I yeah. think also with cats, uh, playing is silent and yeah. fighting is not generally. There's going to be some sound because yeah. cats would rather make sound, as we discussed, than have actual like physical contact, which yeah. can, can really be dangerous for them, you know, out in the wild. If something gets infected, that can be, yeah. can be the, the end of it for them. So they do want to try to not actually have to have, have contact. Yeah. So they tend to be really noisy um, yes. rather than actually <laughs> do anything um, mm -hmm. other than like a soft skibbity pap and like a scream. Um, so if your cats are silent and they ha they're doing this, this facial expression, I think you're, you're pretty safe to assume it's play. Uh, if they're noisy, I would uh, really try to break that up because that's, you yeah. know, 99 times out of 100, that's, that's fighting. Somebody just said, when should I be concerned? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> but, I, mean, I mean, if there's, you know, like if you have two cats, and you could probably speak to this a lot better than I can, but like if the, you have two cats where it's just like every single interaction is really negative and you're seeing those non-affiliative facial expressions, it seems like with every single thing that's happening, um, you probably want to call an animal behaviorist or a trainer to like mm -hmm. see what's going on and, and try to, you know, promote strategies for facilitating a more positive relationship. That's probably when you should be concerned is when it seems like it's just constant fighting and it's to the point where maybe there's like physical injury mm -hmm. on, on a frequent basis and it's interrupting or disrupting you know their daily lives and their ability to like eat food go use a litter box stuff like yeah. that that's probably when you should be concerned yeah. um and i mean the the non-affiliated facial expressions will help you identify that um but it's more about the frequency and other kinds of behaviors and whether or not there's disruptions to like things that they need to do on a daily yeah. basis to be well yeah i would say also staring like if yeah. you're just talking about like if staring's not technically like a facial expression but often aggression begins with just staring yes. you know one cat will just go up to the other cat and just kind of just stare at them yeah and that can really start this bullying aggression um, mm -hmm. and that will often happen around a litter box too so if you have a cat who follows your other cat to the litter box and just stands yeah. and stares that's not great so that's something to be concerned about um, and and fix that add more litter boxes add litter boxes that have uh, better yeah. escape routes don't have them in areas where the cats can't escape um, or have have other exits where they can get away yeah. from the cat who's staring um, stuff like that is what I would look out for that that's um, a little bit more subtle than just hearing them mm -hmm. fight all the time, yeah. you know, or finding lots of fur around your house where you're like, what, ha what happened to this cat? And then they had clearly had a fight. This is the last one. One person said, how do I know when they're happy and when they're angry? Yeah, so I think 
as long as you see a neutral face or you see the ears going forward, the whiskers going forward, they're closing their eyes, they feel safe around the other mm -hmm. cat, right? Because if you think about it like this, like closing your eyes and doing things like showing your belly, that's very vulnerable for a cat, right? So if they're doing that, that's probably a really good sign that they, they trust you, they trust the other cats and things are going well. But if you, you have those tense behaviors, if you have the non-affiliative facial expressions, the growling, the hissing, the hiding and whatnot, that's probably not as good of a sign right right um, and especially with adopting a cats and introducing new cats into the household it's a very time intensive process um and also like keeping in mind like we were saying don't force an interaction yeah. and just kind of like giving them the space that they need to you know to be comfortable with you and to be able to come out and interact with you i think that's really important um in order to facilitate a good relationship with that cat and your other cats or just like you and your cat I, I think is a good call. Yeah. I think one really good way to know if your cats are content is, is to see how they sit with you and with your other cats. And, and to remember that for us as humans, sitting face to face is affiliative, right? That's, it's like us right now. We're talking, we're, you know, face to face, yeah. but for felines, this is actually an aggressive move, right? It's mm -hmm. not the most comfortable for them. So when they're feeling like they really are comfortable around someone else, they will sit what I call butt to butt. And I even yes. made up a dumb <laughs> song about butt to butt that like my wife and I will <laughs> sing in our house when we see our cat. So if you see your cat sitting like butt to butt like this, they're really mm -hmm. good friends. They trust each other. They are touching each other slightly. That is the best scenario that you could see is these cats love each other. They're super happy. They're butt to butt. And if your cat comes and sits butt to butt with you, your cat is super, super happy with you and trusts you and does not view you as someone that they have to keep their eyes on. Right. Yeah. So do you have anything else you want to share with our, our listeners about all of your amazing work? Um, sure. If you're interested in learning more about our work and some of the cool, exciting upcoming projects that we have going on, mm -hmm. um, you can visit my website. It's just www.florkie.com. Uh, we have a lab webpage. We have information about ongoing projects, not just with cats, but dogs and horses and other animals and primates, of course. Um, so feel free to check that out if you want to learn more. Uh, a lot of the cat studies that we have in review or ongoing will publish information there and also on the websites of the nonprofits that we're collaborating with as well. All right, cool. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to, to speak with me and, um, share everything about your super interesting study. I really appreciate yeah. it. And I think of course. this is great for our listeners to learn more about their cat's facial expressions. Oh, well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for listening. As always, if you enjoyed the podcast, please go ahead and give us a rating and or a review. We'd super appreciate it. You can find our social medias, Instagram and TikTok at His Intel Podcast. For cat behavior consultations, go to catitude-adjustment.com. Music provided by Cat Beats.